Hello everyone, I am here with Paula Jean Swearingen who just won her primary in West Virginia and she is facing off against Shelley Moore Capito, a Republican, and um, I think she's going to pull this one off. Paula, welcome back to the program. Hey, Mike. Thank you for having me back. It's always good to be with you. It's always glad to. Uh, I'm always glad to have you on and talk about your campaign. So we have some excited news. Uh, you were just endorsed also by Bernie Sanders. Um, so give mm -hmm. us the update. There's lots of big things happening currently. Uh, what's going on? Um, tell us about the race. Uh, we've had incredible national uh, endorsements. Uh, We've Iron Stashes is, is helping us. Uh, Senator Bernie Sanders, Sen uh, Senator Nina Turner, um, uh, Andrew Yang has endorsed us. Uh, so we've had endorsements across the aisle, and people really stepping up for West Virginia. And right now, it's really incredible. We have a comprehensive uh, campaign team. We have about twelve on staff, and if people say that people-funded campaigns do not work. We have raised over a million dollars. The average donation is $26.30, and we almost outraised my opponent last quarter, even though she is funded by those dark funders. So, you know, if anybody says that money's not an issue, we've had so many people across the country, people that have had to leave the state that want to come back home, that have donated dollars and volunteered. And, you know, it's just, it's up to West Virginia now. Um, to help win this race because everybody has pulled out all the stops for West Virginia. And I'm just so incredibly humbled and proud. And our team has a comprehensive digital strategy. We sent over 80,000 80, texts last week. Um, we have a lot of secret weapons behind the scenes that I don't want to talk about, but everybody has been absolutely incredible. And the thing is about this campaign, it's led mostly by West Virginians. Uh, you know, I'm from Wyoming County. My campaign manager is a black hat coal miner and a trucker, and he is from Logan County, and he's leading the ship. And I can't tell you how proud that makes me um, to show that folks in the coal fields have teeth, shoes, and brains, and you can actually accomplish something. And I'm incredibly proud of my team. Yeah, this is astonishing. I think you're running a phenomenal campaign. Um, you're putting out ads all of the time. Like, this is a very, very active campaign. Uh, you could just see it like you're you're hungry. You all want to win. And I think that you guys are doing a phenomenal job. I do want to ask you, though, about the dynamics of this race, because knowing that there's an uh, open Supreme Court seat since Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away, has that changed anything? Um, I know that Democrats collectively got over a hundred million dollars after RBG passed away last week. Um, and I'm wondering if there's been any extra attention paid to this race now, because um now Shelley Moore Capito is likely, you know, she's going to vote to approve Donald Trump's um, nominee. So have you been able to use this? Is this an effective strategy that will play well in West Virginia? Like, what's your take on this situation? Well, my opponent's kind of cut off her own leg and all, all eyes are on her. And we don't hold her accountable enough because, you know, she sucks and we expect her to suck. But what she did in 2016, she said that uh, we should not have uh, the nomination process happening during election. And she said that uh, West Virginia voters should be able to uh, put their vote in at the ballot box. But now she's saying that she's trying to push a nominee down our throats. And she says she's going to do with what it, uh, whatever Mitch McConnell, Donald Trump wants to do. So West Virginia is a pretty ticked off um, because we know with her voting record in the past and voting for nominees, that she's voted against the working class. And I see, you know, we see a lot of Republicans that are noticing not only is she a hypocrite, but she's a liar. And uh, she's pretty much cut off her legs. She's actually helped us. And, you know, we've had more support because of her poor decisions and her flip-flopping like she does, even with COVID relief. She had the HEROES Act sitting on her desk for three months. She was drafting legislation um, and helped in craft the HEALS Act. Which would take this, which took away the $600 benefit to people that are unemployment on an, on unemployment, and it was basically a slap in the face because she said that uh, it just was not an incentive for people to go back to work. So she essentially, to me, said that she was calling hardworking Americans lazy when they needed help the most. Also, she wanted to push people back into unsafe working conditions and not hold any liability to employers um, if someone got sick. When she came home, 
uh, they went into recess till after Labor Day, having that legislation on her desk, not pushing for anything. She came home with our governor, Jim Justice, had a $25,000 plated fundraiser, $11,500 for a photo op, while she was talking about pushing our children, our teachers, our public service personnel back into schools, while she was having digital press briefings with our governor, pretty much saying that she was out of touch and only thing she was worried about was serving her, corp you know, her corporate donors. She's never had to have a real job except for her political career. She's never had to wonder where her next meal is going to come from. So many things. She's proven over and over and over that she's out of touch with West Virginians, even tying into economic diversity, which you've talked to, you know, you've heard me talk about it over and over and how broadband, comprehensive broadband in this state plays a role in that. We, we know digitally it ties into our educational system pre-COVID and especially since COVID with her push to put children back into school, as well as our communications. She's trying to sell broadband to the highest bidder. She's trying to privatize it. We have seen over and over with broadband in this state, we've had companies that got state and federal funding and sent and spent it out of state. And instead of making it into a public utility, she's just put a for sale sign on our heads again, and especially our children right now that are so dependent on digital learning. And we have hotspots across the state where children can go and sit in the parking lot and download their work. And so it's, it's like not taking care of the most vulnerable in our society because we're dealing with the addiction epidemic. So many people don't have rural transportation. So what are they gonna do? They're gonna push the most vulnerable children back into the classrooms in buildings that have poor ventilation systems. Our educators are doing everything that they can, but I know that I've talked to some educators that are talking about writing their wills and talking about what they're gonna do if they get sick right now. And we have seen an uptick of COVID right now in West Virginia, and so many people are afraid. And we are in the fight for our lives and we know it. And when I talk to my neighbor and ask him for a rent, he doesn't ask me if I'm a Democrat or Republican. He comes over and helps me and he brings that rich. And you hear me say all the time, we are some of the most united people um, in the country. I've never seen people united like we are in West Virginia. And we've made history, Mike. I don't know if people know because the national media is not talking about it. We had over 93 candidates and candidates in this state with the West Virginia Can't Wait movement run for office this time. 43 of those candidates won their races. Every single Democratic nominee for Congress, the first congressional district, the second, the third, and United States Senate are women. We're all progressive. None of us take corporate PAC dollars and we're ready to bust the halls of Congress and make sure that West Virginians have a seat at the table. It's a pivotal time in West Virginia, and I'm just so humbled and proud to be part of this movement. That's really encouraging. It seems like in West Virginia, what we're seeing is kind of a political realignment in a sense um, to where, you know, this common struggle across the state is really uniting people and these partisan differences that kind of um, characterize a lot of the um, chaos in other states. It's not necessarily prevalent in your state. And one thing that I wanted to ask you about, because you talked about how COVID-19 is affecting your state, is the eviction crisis, because Trump's moratorium on evictions expires after December mm -hmm. 31st. So on January 1st, there's going to be millions of Americans across the country who are going to be expected to pay months in back rent. And if that's not extended, if Trump, for example, loses the selection and he kind of chooses not to act as a lame duck president, um, it's just going to be a disaster. So has Shelley Moore Capito done anything to attempt to ameliorate this crisis in her home state? Is she offering resources or even information to voters? Because I feel like this is such a huge disaster that it should be on the minds of every single member of Congress. And I just don't see that action. I don't see the urgency. So can you kind of speak to this? Because this is something that she has to at least be aware of. Well, the HEROES Act, like I said, it said on her desk, you know, she's got commercials out now. I was there for West Virginia. I voted for the first relief package, but also she's been pushing for corporate bailouts and big bailouts for real estate companies in the middle of a relief package. And she's not really pushing to help West Virginians. And this, we're one of the sickest and poorest states in the nation. And it's been proven statistically that we are the most impacted by COVID because of addiction, because of black lung, cancer, heart disease, uh, cardiovascular, I mean, uh, diabetes, 
uh, we are just with these people here are sick and poor and we have a large bulk of our population that is elderly she's even tried to turn medicare into a voucher program when people ask her about medicare for all she thinks it's going to be medicare for none when she tried to privatize medicare and take you know the medicare that our elderly already have away from them and privatize it and you know like i said put a for sale sign on it she was the first woman to be elected to the united states senate to represent the state of west virginia she's a mother and grandmother she voted against equal pay for women at least three times and west virginians see the differences in this campaign and the difference with her because this country girl does not want to go to dc it's about survival it's making sure that west virginians have a seat at the table and she has done nothing as a mother and grandmother and turned a blind eye on the children dying and starving in this state I really want to ask her the question, how does she sleep at night? But she won't even debate me. Um, she's shying away from a debate because she knows that she's gonna be called out for her years and years of being a corporate servant, getting rich off our backs. In 2008, you can make your own decision about this and your own assessment. But when the stock, the stock market uh, collapsed, her husband was selling stock the day before. Uh, so we know who she is. We know what's going on with her. She's there because of her dad's corrupt dynasty, and she continues with corruption across the state. And we have not given her enough heat. And it's time for a mother and a grandmother to actually make sure that our children have a chance to grow and thrive and have a future in our state for a change. Yeah, and I think that the reason why she doesn't want to debate you is because if you if you really juxtapose both of your campaigns and your messages, it's night and day. Uh, I think she would just be uh, landslided because like when you speak, you speak really thoroughly to all of the specific things that impact the people of West Virginia. You talk about how, you know, um, the issues that are already disproportionately affecting coal miners, for example, that intersects with COVID-19 and creates a bigger disaster. So if you were to ask her, healthcare. What do we do? What's your plan? She wouldn't be able to answer that. And I wanted to ask you about that as well, because, you know, she doesn't have a plan for the eviction crisis. Um, does she have any sort of idea what she wants to do for healthcare reform? Because, I mean, Trump over and over has been saying it's coming. It's coming. Meanwhile, we see nothing. So are other Republicans, such as uh, Capito, are they doing anything to ameliorate the health care crisis? Because assuming Trump gets his new Supreme Court nominee approved, then the ACA is most likely going to be repealed, which means that protections for patients with pre-existing conditions, that goes away. People in West Virginia will be affected by that, probably more so than others in the country because they are, you know, uh, they experience black lung and whatnot from uh, being coal miners. What has she said with regard to health care? I mean, has she just been silent? She just keeps on talking about protecting health insurance companies and framing it as she's going to protect health insurance. And even with this administration and with Trump's tax plan that went through, you know, what the bulk of our population is on Medicare and Medicaid already. And even though we still have the expansion for adult Medicaid in the state, the income criteria changed under this tax plan and our hospitals were already under red alert because people were having to go into the ER for basics like sinus infections because they were not covered under Medicaid anymore. Uh, so, you know, it's she's talking about putting more food into food banks, but she's not talking about how we can get people less dependent on food banks and making sure that they have a living wage and we have a diverse economy in this state. Actually, we had an endorsement from the newspaper called the Dominion Post, which is in Mon County, and they are very known to be conservative. And they really come out against her after we interviewed with them because it really brought up all the issues and how, and how out of touch she really is. And so many Republicans have come into the fold with this campaign we are in the fight for our lives and you know we want basic human rights and we want economic diversity we want long-term solutions to the addiction epidemic everybody deserves health care and those are basics the three top basics that all west virginians want and we don't have to agree or you know on everything but we've come up to a place in this country 
whether we have representatives, it's not a football game first and foremost. But if we do have a two party system, we need people that are setting down and thinking about the people that they are supposed to serve instead of corporations and lobbyists and making sure that they have our best interest at heart. And that's why we've seen a movement on a local level to a federal level with West Virginia Can't Wait and brand new Congress because ordinary people are standing up and saying, hey, we just want to be representative for, represented for a change you know, of the people, by the people, for the people. That's what our government should be. We can, we don't have to agree on everything, but we have to make sure that people are intended to represent us, period. And that's what's going on with my opponent. I mean, I've, I've been angry at her for a long, long time because she is a mother and grandmother and she's had mothers knocking on her door trying to get arrested in her office we've had people throw paper airplanes over the top of the door to get her attention because she won't even her staff won't even answer the door and that's why even here and now my telephone number is 304-894-7472 nobody's going to have to get arrested in my office to get attention as a matter of fact when I go to D.C., I'm going to make sure all these people that have been working in the front lines of our communities trying to solve our problems have a seat at the table in writing legislation that impacts our daily lives and making sure that we do have true change and they do have a true voice in Washington. Yeah, and I think that you, you really put it perfectly. You said we don't have to agree on everything. And, you know, I think you've been really effective at putting out this message that it's really obvious that she just doesn't care. Like, it's not even like she has solutions that you disagree with. She just doesn't have solutions. She's not proposing That's anything. You just you see this ambivalence from her, which is just astonishing to me when we are facing an unprecedented level of crisis in this country with, you know, a global pandemic and the economic uh, depression resulting from that pandemic. So even if like I didn't agree with anything she proposed, at least by proposing something, there's at least some initiative like you're showing to us that you care. But we get nothing from her, which is astonishing to me, especially because this is an election year. She's seeking reelection. So it, it's it's shocking. Now, I basically she's showing her for photo ops. I think she got some legislation uh it passed for commemorative coins, but what does that do for the people yeah. in West Virginia? Uh, you know, she has it. You know, we hear Capito Connect for five and a half years. She's been talking about broadband in our state. Where is it? You know, she's been in office in Congress for a long time. And look, you know, anybody with common sense can look around and look at our neighbors and look at our communities and say, if she really means what she says during election season then how come we don't see it every day and it's not happening that's happened with so many of our incumbents in their state and that's why so many people here are stepping up and running for office and raising hell because these people are not doing their jobs and my slogan investing in ourselves that's what west virginians are doing if they're not going to do their jobs we're coming to take them we ain't taking it no more yeah, that's beautifully put. So I think that anyone who um, has been watching The Humanist Report for a while is already familiar with your campaign. They know about you. They support you. We're all rooting for you. So please help us help you. Let us know what you need from us. How can we help you if we live in West Virginia or not? Uh, what can we do to make sure that you beat her in November? We have to keep making those impressions. We need volunteers first and foremost. We sent over 80,000 texts last week. We need more people on the horn making those phone calls. You know, every dollar counts if people can still donate. We need to fundraise so we can get broadcast television. We know that she's going to take off her money and invest in that to reach voters. And, you know, it's not a problem of reaching voters. It's, it's you know, reaching voters to to we have to get them motivated to the polls as well as learning this campaign and knowing that i'm not a polished politician i'm not here making campaign promises i'm a mother and grandmother too and i want to make sure that my grandchild can stay here and live here and grow so you know let's get on the horn this is go time we're in the fight for our lives I will be a federal representative, so I'll represent everybody across this country. And so this is not just about West Virginia. This is making sure no matter who our president is, we have a good, strong Congress, especially the Senate, especially with everything that's going on with the Supreme Court right now. We don't need a rubber stamp 
for blue or red. We need somebody that is going to put somebody in that seat that is actually going to do their job and make decisions for the American people. So there'll be links um, in the description box to uh, Paula's website for those watching. Please, I would encourage you to support her. Um, this is a fight for our lives. I, I think that there's no other way to describe it. And by, by you know, explaining it the way that you did, you really are phenomenal at articulating what's at stake. Like, this is this is everything. So much um, is at stake. So uh, we are going to be rooting for you. Thank you so much for coming on the program. I look forward to speaking to you after you win. I think that's going to be um, really exciting. And uh, it gives us a little bit of hope. Like you running, you winning your primary, it gives us hope. So thank you for that. And thank you for fighting for everyone, um, not just thank in West Virginia, but around the country. We are absolutely looking to you, you know, as a source for inspiration. So uh, we love you, Paula. Thank you so much for coming on. We love you too, Mike. Thank you for uh, raising the voice of the voiceless and making sure that these campaigns get the coverage that they need because we, you know, the status quo, they're going to do everything they can to fight against us. And it's people like you that uh, we get the word out and, uh, you know, and people know about campaigns like ours and you've worked so hard and I've watched you grow since 2018 and I can't thank you enough. You oh, inspire well, me. Oh, well, thank you. Heart. Thank you. That means so much coming from you. You know, it's, it's a little bit shocking that um, campaigns like yours aren't getting national attention, you know, given what's at stake. Um, and mm -hmm. it's frustrating to me. So, you know, I feel like I have to try to fill that role as much as I possibly can. And, you know, it's just it's, it's nice to be able to um, even just do a little bit and talk to you and hopefully get people to recognize the importance of this race, because it's it's everything. It is everything. It's so important. Well, you know, I'm only one vote, so everybody needs, if they're looking at the dynamic in Congress, go to brandnewcongress.org, look at all the candidates that went through the primary, because I can go to D.C. and I can raise all the hell that I want, but we need votes to pass leg legislation. And so look at all these candidates and make sure that we are putting our support behind them so we can work with each other and actually bring change for a change. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's not just like getting one or two more people elected like this is changing the makeup of congress like this is we're we're thinking long term we're playing the long game now and your victory is absolutely crucial um and i think that my viewers at least you know uh they acknowledge that it's just a matter of getting everyone else to understand why these races are so important and why we have to elect people who are actually fighting for working americans um that's why we're rooting for you so thanks so much for coming on i won't keep you any longer because i know you've got a jet to your next interview but thank you so much paula it's always a pleasure talking to you thank you mike have a good night you too